Okay people, welcome back to the second part of the Parasitical Elites. I didn't want to leave you hanging on the edge of your seats there, so I'll just uh, continue the rest of this chapter whilst I'm uploading my premiere, the, the, first, the first part, um, to YouTube. So, without further ado, back to the page 72. Our elder pre-Irish Aryan brothers contributed extraordinarily to the enlightenment and evolution of the great civilizations of the Western world. Although we now call this island Ireland, it has been variously known over millennia as Scotia or Scotland Major after an Egypt Egyptian princess called Scotta, who we will be looking at in more detail later, and Hibernia after the name of the race of people from Spain known as the Iberes, the Gaelic name for Hebrews. Hebrews was not Jews, but an earlier race, who migrated to Ireland from the Iberian Peninsula. Magdari claims, the greatest and most prolonged struggle in ancient times that we have any account of, or reliable tradition of, was the war between Rome and Ireland, whose name at the time was Ire. It was only after she was sacked and destroyed, and her sacred altars laid in ruins by the English invaders at the instigation of Rome, that the English priests gave their name Ireland. It would seem Rome, who could never conquer Ireland by force, did it through the manipulation of religion. It is not only alternative researchers who postulate Ireland was the cradle of Western civilization. Academics like Professor Charles Totten confirm the alternate view. The early story of Ireland is the key to Western history and its Western course of empire. Geoffrey Moorhouse endorses what Professor Totten says from the same volume. The Irish monks of the Middle Ages have been credited with saving Western civilization. When we reflect on the ancient exodus from Bru Naboin, we discover that it is echoed in the relatively modern Irish migrations that took place from the early 17th century onwards to the New World. For instance, 15 of the US presidents had Scotch-Irish roots. They were also instrumental in shaping of the fledgling states as they sought their individuality and freedom. The Scots-Irish influence on early American history is well documented, but author Paddy McGarvey, whose novel Solution to the Irish Question is to create an American-style neutral capital situated in the Boyne Valley, insists the Battle of the Boyne led directly to the British surrender of America at Yorktown 90 years later and 100,000 Scots-Irish Presbyterians who brought her that about are missing from the history books of Ireland, Great Britain and America. He also relates that while the capital of the United States was being chosen, George Washington was receiving the seal of office from a former orphan farm boy, Charlie Thompson of Magera, County Derry, in ancient Ulster. Both houses of the Commonwealth Congress met on the same day to endorse the choice of Potomac come Washington as the north-south capital of the United States of America, a choice resulting directly from William's victory at the Boyne. To underscore the point, the date of the affirmation was July the 12th, 1790, the Boyne's centenary date by the Gregorian calendar. The Scots-Irish race had the same civilising effect on humanity as their ancestors, the Phoenician Arians. It is that motivates the parasitical elite to ascribe such importance to the suppression of the memory of this race and its homeland. Would we discover the sacred isles, the British isles, were the original holy lands? How that would change society? They also don't wish to risk the discovery that our prehistoric ancestors were not Stone Age cave dwellers, as commonly depicted, but were in fact an advanced race of civilising scientists, astronomers and mathematicians. Again, this would change the status quo according to Irish historian Ian Adamson. The greatest achievement of these early pre-Celtic peoples, who form at least one half of our genetic makeup, with the megalithic monuments of Newgrange, Noth and Douth in the Boyne Valley, the architectural and engineering skill displayed by this community, no less the artistic sensibility demonstrated by the carved stones, bears testimony to the high degree of culture attained by them. We had a rich and colourful history bequeathed to us by our answers that we never received and are, for the most part, unaware of it. If we could be convinced of what Ian Adaman says, it would change the view we have of reality and our society would be seen in a completely new context. With the fuel of our right history, we would be propelled into a very different future than the bleak one we now face. We would recognise this anti-civilisation for, for that's what it actually is, and how our minds are captured by its transitory pleasures and ir irrationalities. How much further ought our civilization 
to have evolved if, as more and more non-establishment researchers and authors are confirming, our ancestors, in contradiction of being non-evolved cave dwellers or a refined scientific race, would this not show that someone or something has hindered their progress? And would, it, would this not finally change how we perceive our world and ourselves? There is an ample evidence of the importance of Ireland in putting history into its proper context. Cross and Slover says of it, All who have even the slightest acquaintance with the early literature of Western Europe now recognise the particular importance which attaches to the traditions of ancient Ireland. The oldest literature of Ireland has been well called the earliest voice from the dawn of Western European civilization. The significance of this fact has been too often neglected. They are probably referring to the first great European epic, Tainbo Colan, or the Cat Cattle Raid of Cooley, as it is more commonly known. This original vernacular epic introduces into the Irish mythos the great Ulster hero, Satana, who later became known as Cú Culain, meaning in English the Hound of Cullen a warrior of the Red Branch Knights, similar to the Knights of the Round Table. Professor Mike Bailey of Queen's University, Belfast, interprets the legend of Kilkelein in an entirely different way than customary. He postulates that there was being portrayed in the tales of the exploits of Kilkelein as the factual story of a comet that collided with the Earth. Three of the dates that Professor Bailey puts forward that coincide with the cometary collisions with the Earth and which he deals with in detail in his book Exodus to Arthur are of special interest to us. They are 2354 to 2345 BCE, 1628 BCE and 540 CE. The first of these dates encompass Usher's date for the time of the biblical flood. The second he attaches to the Exodus and the third he refers to the so-called Dark Ages. While in conversation with Professor Bailey regarding his theories, he relayed related to me a synchronism that seemed to be the norm when engrossed in this type of research. Unknown to him at the time, he was formulated his own theories about Ku Kulain. There was on the other side of the world another academic doing the same research and researching similar conclusions. Dorothea Kenny, a professor in the English Department of California State University at Fullerton, whose area of specialisation is the study of Irish mythology, writing about the legend of Ku Kulain, proposes the following. I suggest in conclusion that a comet, Balor, or the evil eye, broke apart perhaps into two pieces, Lug and Balor, mythological characters of the Ulster Cycle, and that its last commentary or meteoric appearance, with loud noises, fireballs, atmospheric dust and fiery stuff, had been given romantic shape in the epic, epic tale, Tain Bu Kalein, centering on the extraordinary character of Ku Kalein. If the theories of these two are proved to be correct, they will have added significantly to confirming that the people who originally related these myths were of a completely different consciousness than is extant, extant today. This proposition, when examined fully, illustrates how it's possible for the controllers to influence our minds with sinister ideas. Bailey and Kenny theorised that a factual event in the Irish prehistory, vis-a-vis -vis a commentary cataclysm, was interpreted as a myth, whereas the mythic ritual battle was interpreted as a holy factual event, that is to say, a religious battle. There was a real sense of synchronicity when reading their theories because there was an objective and independent research confirming that my line of investigation into the truth of our history was heading in the right direction. They also demonstrate how myths and facts could be confused and misinterpreted. Those myths were originally recorded by non-conscious, non-conceptual, hallucinating mind, are interpreted by us with our conceptual, introspective mind. There are several explanations how these people, who it is suggested were not conscious, could have aspired to a level of knowledge that is unsurpassed. A careful and thorough study of Julian Jane's book, see footnote 68, demonstrates how consciousness was discovered within a much older automatic reacting mind that collapsed because it could not cope with the more complex circumstances they eventually had to face. Jane explains in detail how this could have ever happened. He put forward the theory that complicated ideas and concepts can be formulated and carried out in unconscious areas of the brain. Indeed, he claims that objective consciousness can be a hindrance to these higher functions of our brain. The following simple example demonstrates his concept. Try recalling something you are trying to become skilled at, such as learning to drive a car for example. You will recall how difficult it was at first when you had to keep your whole attention on the task and how effortless it seemed to be when it had became learned. 
Our awareness, consciousness, was no longer required and the task was carried out unconsciously. Dr. Frank's Wallace Award won an article, Consciousness, the End of Authority, which he penned in response to Julian Jane's book, is an excellent introduction to how the bicameral mind operates. In his article, Dr. Wallace clearly defines the significance of the difference of these two radically different methods of thinking and demonstrates that the man was a feeling and emotional being long before he was a rational being. In summary, the bicameral mind is a two-chambered automatic guidance system that directed unconscious or natural man. It could be compared to the reactive mind of other primates. But because of this much larger brain, man was able to develop a coherent language. He was then guided by audio hallucinations. Those hallucinations evolved in the right hemisphere of the brain and were heard as communication or commands in the left side of the brain. This arrangement of mind constitutes the metaphorical Garden of Eden, the reason it was never and will never be found outside of our minds. When man was being guided by the voice of God, he had no responsibilities. He did exactly what the voices told him to do and thereby had no stressful choices to make. Everything was calm and organised. Man walked with God. Inner struggles were not a phenomenon they, could have, they would have recognised. Then man committed the original sin by his necessary discovery of subjective consciousness, the I. He gained knowledge of self. It was then that Adam and Eve, man and woman, were cast out from the Garden of Eden. And the Lord God, by camera or God, the God part of the mind, said, Behold, the man has become one of us to know good and evil. This was the beginning of our journey to consciousness and is the reason religion keeps us feeling guilty about our discovery that we can prosper and commune with our own God, leaving them powerless. It is possible that the biblical narrative is a symbolic story of a soul personality and its historical journey evolving out of a singular, by camera, consciousness, the Old Testament, to the discovery of individual Christ consciousness, the story of the birth and life of Jesus, the New Testament. Eminent scientist Richard Berglund described describing the workings of the brain notes. You have two brains, a left and a right. Modern brain scientists now know that your left brain is your verbal and rational brain. It thinks serious, serially and reduces its thoughts to numbers, letters and words. Your right brain is your non-verbal and intuitive brain. It thinks in patterns or pictures, composed of whole things, and does not comprehend reductions, either numbers, letters or words. For a clearer understanding, of how the hemispheres of the brain interact, Betty Edwards' book, Drawn on the Right Side of the Brain, is strongly recommended for the layperson. In the following quote, she gives some imaginative examples of how down through the years we have, because of the dichotomy in our brain, been in conflict with ourselves. Throughout the human's history, terms with connotations of good for the right hand, left, left hemisphere, and connotations of bad for the left hand hemisphere appear in most languages around the world. The Latin word is left is sinister, meaning bad, ominous, treacherous. The Latin word for right is dexter, from which comes a word dexterity, meaning skill or adroitness. The French word for left, remember that left is, the left hand is connected to the right hemisphere, is gauche, meaning awkward, from which comes our word gawky. The French word for right is droite, meaning good, just or proper. She goes on to give some other examples. And you can most likely identify some of your own. Being caught in two minds is one, but you get the idea, however. It is important to remember that these terms were made up when languages began by some person's left hemisphere, the left brain calling the right bad names, and the right brain labelled, pinpointed, and buttonholed was without a language of its own to defend itself. Does this not sound like a deserted, bicameral child man ranting about the voice of the gods who had deserted him when his bicameral mind was in the process of breaking down. Edwards demonstrates that the modern theories of the brain point to the infected remnants of a bicameral mind being confused with our conscious mind, and, that it, and isn't this how we are left open to manipulation? Reading some of the earlier books of the Bible, Jeremiah for example, or the Iliad and the Odyssey, according to Jane's, these two great Greek epics straddle the breakdown of the bicameral era and the beginning of consciousness, would give us a better understand of how the bicameral mind works. You may begin to understand the confusion amongst historians without knowledge of the bicameral or nature mind when trying to explain how myths and legends were originally documented. The people recording events of 3,000 years ago and earlier 
would be wholly bicameral, which means they would be recording events projected and interpreted by the right, non-discriminatory side of the brain, God, as oral instructions in the left hemisphere, man. Modern psychology, was we discovered, confirms that the right side of the brain is a part that communicates and can only communicate through symbolism. When both areas of the brain synchronise, we become a holistic being of mind, body and soul, working together in perfect harmony. In summary, the right hemisphere of the brain we have interpreted as the voice of God and the left side as the man part. We have seen both sides can work independently, but in contradiction to the above, this leads to disharmony, unhappiness and illness. This is the true hell of religion. That is to say, when man re rejects the God of his heart or refuses to listen to the voice of his inner or true self. For those that are discovering the theory of the bicameral mind for the first time, there is a need for a simple model of how it works in our everyday lives. Consider how our mind reacts while we sleep. You may be able to use that as a model to gain a better understanding of the workings of this ancient mindset. We know that when we sleep our outside environment can influence us. If, for instance, if we, hear a, if we were to hear a dog barking outside our room, this could lead us to dream of a dog chasing us. Our brain tricks us into thinking we're going through a series of events that appear to last for a long time. However, when we wake we know it was a dream since our reason and mind kicks in. But in the case of the bicameral mind, 3,000 years ago, the kicking in of the conscious mind never happened and the dream events were recorded as real experiences. Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? Briefly, people three millennia ago had what we might call an animal awareness, a kind of animal consciousness, but they weren't conscious of being aware. Today we are conscious that we are conscious, at least some of the time. Given some thought during your waking hours to how long you are objectiv objectively conscious, you may be surprised how much of the day you are not conscious of your actions and yet you, barring accidents, cope adequately. A simple experiment will prove this as you go about your usual tasks. Stop every now and then and say to yourself, conscious, 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 and analyse if you were, up to that moment, being conscious of your actions. Don't underestimate this simple exercise. Variations of it have been used by the yogis to teach their students for a long time. To see you may believe, but when you experience, you understand. The foregoing gives us insight into how the myths and legends of history could have been distorted and manipulated. During the 17th century, there was still a strong inclination towards symbolism, as, are, as even today. That's why the ritual battle at the Boyne River, although a mixture of bicameralism, symbolism and logic, objectivism, was interpreted as a wholly objective or left-brain activity. If we were to integrate the work of pioneering authors, researchers, especially the findings of Commons, Beaumont, Filofsky and Bailey, with the theories of Julian Jaynes, we would be shown a dramatically different and more honest view of history than the one we had foisted on us. Professor Bailey's lecture to the Warp Conference in 1988 is a good example of this. At some time around 2300 plus 200 BC, a large number of the major civilizations of the world collapsed. The Old Kingdom in Egypt, the Akkadian Empire in Mesopotamia, the early Bronze Age societies in Anatolia, Greece and Israel, as well as the Indus Valley civilization in India, the Helmand civilization in Afghanistan and the Hogshan culture in China, the first urban civilizations in the world all fell into ruin at more or less the same time. The dates in Bailey's lecture concur with the period Julian Jane proposes for the beginnings of the breakdowns of bicameral civilizations disintegrating as structured societies and sheds some light on why these civilizations may have collapsed. A more compelling comparison or what might be called the final phases of the breakdown, can be found in Mike Bailey's book, Exodus to Arthur. What Bailey documents as an environmental event is the same epoch, 1000 BCE, that Jane gives for the final collapse of the bicameral civilizations and the beginning of subjective conceptual consciousness. This could explain the esoteric symbolism of the phoenix arising out of the ashes. Professor Bailey goes on to say, Sometime near or in the 12th century BC, Allowing for flexibility in archaeological and ancient historical evidence, the whole fabric of ancient society appears to have crumbled. Consequently, as the bicameral civilizations broke down, they had out of necessity to discover or invent a new way to organise their lives without the voice of the gods directing them. 
They invented a new way of modelling reality in a desperate effort to make sense of an unknown world they found themselves in and from where it seemed the gods had flown. The following true antidote helps demonstrate the awful predicament these bicameral beings found themselves in and will also demonstrate that the remnants of the mind are still exist existent in today's world. In a conversation with a friend, he related to me a conversation he had with an artist friend who was undergoing treatment for schizophrenia. His friend said to him, Frank, when I pray to God, they say I am pious, but when God talks to me, they say I am mad. This telling story demonstrates the bicameral mind is still extant and can be triggered to seek and serve outside authorities, the role the elite tried to fulfil in place of the gods. Understanding how self-conscious grew out of the bicameral mind is a major key to unlocking knowledge about our hidden history, more so than the majority of the establishment archaeologists or historians will ever admit they have their careers to protect. Without this knowledge, it is impossible to clarify ambiguities found throughout established history. Myths are told over and over ad nauseum as left-brain objective events until we completely accept them. This has the effect of keeping the pop populace in a comatose state to blindly accept what they are told about history while a deception is built around us that pulls the curtains on the reality that lies behind the illusion. It is a world that has been pulled over our eyes to blind us to the truth. How a false interpretation of history is being used to fulfil the agenda for humanity is so diabolically clever it is invisible to all but a few. Not because these are few are special or more intelligent, but because they have put forth the effort and initiative to think differently about themselves and their world. The one thing the system cannot cope with is individual initiative and will always try to control it, and if it can't, it will destroy it. Moreover, these relatively few eventual, eventually begin to become aware of the illusion that embraces them and to discover who the architect of this fantasy is. It is almost certain that no honest, non-agenda researcher ever expected to find the shocking story that unfolded when they began their quest. Unfortunately, most of, their, most of them are unnerved by the system. It is difficult for investigators to uncover the source of a parasitical system and, more significantly, to document a credible account of it. The most that can be hoped for is for unconventional authors, researchers, to persist in putting seeds of doubt into the mind of their audience concerning the reality of the theatrical world we live in. Shakespeare's metaphor that the whole world is a stage and that we're all actors upon it should have taken on a different significance at this conjuncture. Shakespeare points towards an illusion, self-perpetuated or imposed by the elite, probably a mixture of both, which proves it has been known for hundreds of years. To sum up, no one can be convinced about this all-inclusive matrix through the debate or instruction. They can only be pointed to the path. Each individual will only discover the outrageous truth for him or herself, and everyone, with a little effort and an inquiring mind, can and must. No one can show you the matrix, you must see it for yourself. It must be obvious by now how essential it is we distinguish between the paradise we have been told is true history and actual history. Simply, our hidden history reveals our sovereignty, or put another way, our individual di divinity. This is the identity the elites have uh, usurped. With the religious hoaxes, they tore God out of our hearts and hid him behind a cloud of lies. But when we understand the truth, we discover, as a conscious beings, we are collect collectively the consciousness of the universe, the highest value the cosmos created, or as Job put it, sons of God. Accepting this fully, we begin to acquire a self-esteem we would never have thought possible. Once attained, the power of self-realisation will lay bare to us the reality of who we are, and then your adventure really begins. Humans are destined to soar to dizzying heights. Nothing and no one can prevent this. Discerning exploration of the Old Testament shows the truth about an usurped inheritance appearing repeatedly. Read Genesis chapter 38, for example. Mikhail Bakunin 1814-1876 hints at man's evolution to divinity without explicitly identifying the illusion he is, so hosti he is hostage to. If it is permissible and even useful and necessary to turn back to study our past, it is only in order to establish what we have been and must no longer be, what we have believed and thought and must no longer believe or think what we have done and must do nevermore. Respect for man is the supreme law of humanity and the great, the real goal of history, its only legitimate objective, 
as the humanization and emancipation, the real liberty, the prosperity and happiness of each individual living in society. For, in the final analysis, we must clearly recognize that collective liberty and prosperity exist only in as far as they represent the sum of individual liberties and pros prosperities. As this illusion dissolves before our eyes, we will discover behind it a completely new sunlit world of health, wealth and happiness, the real world of conscious beings. The paradox is, of course, that this is a world we already inhabit and would see it if we would free our captive minds from the fantasies that have conditioned us, keeping us chained to a world of illusion, a world of priests and politicians. The truths of religion are never so well understood as by those who have lost the power of reasoning. Voltaire Philosophical Dictionary, 1764. This is no easy task we have given ourselves, for it requires constant effort of rational thinking and complete honesty to deconstruct the illusion of our minds have accepted as real. However, the rewards are huge. These include complete freedom and the disappearance of a parasitical ma matrices of control. To, to live the life we were meant to live, and they know it, the spectacular deception of our history, personal and collective, assures the power brokers of society for a time of being a comfortable life of dominance over our lives, and they use the bicameral aspects of our minds to achieve this. George Orwell shows this works through O'Brien's interrogations of Winston in his landmark book, 1984. There was a party slogan dealing with the control of the past, he said. Repeat it, if you please. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past, repeated Winston obediently. Who controls the present controls the past, said O'Brien, nodding his head with slow approval. O'Brien continues to quiz Winston in Socratic style as to where the past exists. If at all, Winston has led to the conclusion it is in memory. In memory? Very well then. We, the party, control all records. and We control all memories. Then we control the past, do we not? Time is fast approaching when some difficult personal choices have to be made. Should we continue to believe the myths that are approved for our consumption and are taught through the controlled state-run educational system and media? Or should we put forth the effort to educate ourselves because we will never truly learn about ourselves within the system as Trinity intuits. The matrix cannot tell you who you are. Defaulting on our responsibilities mean we continue to submit to a system that concentrates power in the hands of the few, the elite, which gives them the means to decide our future. Is this what we want? Do, you, do we choose to be robots? Of course, some individuals will refuse to believe any of this because they know they are in control of their life and destiny. Still, they do have a point since there are always going to be contradictions when trying to explain these concepts because we live in a closed system of irrationality. While it is indeed true that we control many aspects of our everyday lives, the truth is that we are only in control within an limited classification that is deemed appropriate for us in this upside down world of deception. The hidden controllers delight in the beauty and seemingly complexity of their creation because it is also per pervasive and seemingly invisible. It is all around us even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television set. You can feel it when you go to work, when you pay your ta taxes. Morpheus. The bloodlines who helped evolve the system machine are no longer deemed to be important or necessary for its continuation because it is now self-perpetuating. The true strength of this illusionary world is found in our willing acceptance and incredibly our defence of it thus assuring its continuation. The nephew of Sigmund Freud, Edward L. Bernays, the father of public relations, although some might say father of mind control, demonstrated throughout his life how mass psychology can easily be used to attain predetermined results. Edward L. Bernays, an Austrian immigrant and nephew of Sigmund Freud, is often credited with being the father of public relations. He served the US government's propaganda arm, the US Committee on Public Information during World War I. He went on to tutor political leaders on the use of mass media and the engineering of consent in the mid-20th century. Bernays was named one of the most influential Americans of the century by Life magazine. One of the most influential Americans of the century, and yet, how many people have ever heard of him? Anonymity, anonymity suited him, as he indicates. 
Those who manipulate their organised habits and opinions of the masses constitute an invisible government which is the true rule and power of our country. We are dominated by a relatively small number of persons as civilization has become more complex. The technical means have been invented and developed by which opinion may be regimented. It is not generally realised to what extent the word, words and actions of our most influential public men are dictated by shrewd persons operating behind the scenes. Even a cursory look at Bernays' life and work would be educational because it proves how relatively easy it is for the system to capture and control our minds, as long as we give them permission, although it needs to be said, never our spirit. Of necessity, control begins in our institutes of learning. Professor Owen, Dean of the Faculty of Science of Queen's University of Belfast, illustrates what university should mean for the student. He protests that university is not an extension of school. It was never intended as a career cram shop. University should be a forum for exchange of ideas, a place for original thinking and birthing new theories. Sadly, this was never to be the purpose. Professor Owen misses the point. Their minds had already been captured and compartmentalised from a young age within the educational system. Original thinking was never intended to be part of the system. The Jesuits' axiom, give me the child before the seventh year and I'll give you the man, makes this disturbingly clear. Joy Elmer Morgan, former editor of the National Education Association Journal and the Teaching and World Government, writes, In the struggle to establish an adequate world government, the teacher can do much to prepare the hearts and minds of children, condition and control, for global understanding and cooperation. At the very heart of all the agencies which will assure the coming of the world, governments must stand the school, the teacher and the organised profession. Still not convinced? In the writings of John Taylor Gatto, an award-winning New York school teacher for 30 years reveals that the public school's hidden agenda is to produce good worker and consumer bees for corporate and economic benefit. This is certainly food for thought. His book, Underground History of American Education, should be compulsory reading for every parent and anyone else who is sincerely trying to understand the world we live in. It will certainly convince any rational person that the system begins its control in our junior schools. The author places a strong emphasis in this equation on the individual, on the entrepreneur in control of himself and his livelihood. This is an important part of Mr Gatto's argument for why and how compulsory schooling was inflicted upon our society. By way of example, Mr Gatto details the lives of archetypal Americans like Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Edison, who were independent, free-thinking leaders, none of whom spent more than two years in any kind of school and yet all were leading, leading productive, fulfilled lives by the time they were in their teens. Mr Gatto argues that big business knew that development of these kind of individuals needed to be hindered. They were too unpredictable and insufficiently pliable. Gatto wrote many essays. The couple of examples that follow should convince the most sceptical among us about the nefarious agendas in our schools. Although Gatto writes about schools in the USA, the same principles can be applied to any school system in the West. Our form of compulsory schooling is an invention of the state of Massachusetts around 1850. It was resisted, sometimes with guns, by an estimated 80% of the Massachusetts population. The last outpost is Barnstable on Cape Cod, not surrendering its children until the 1880s, when the area was seized by militia and children marched to the school under guard. The next step came in 1890, when Andrew Carnegie wrote 11 essays called The Gospel of Wealth, in it, he said that capitalism, free enterprise, was stone cold dead in the United States, it had been killed by its own success, that men like himself, Mr Morgan and Mr Rockefeller, now owned everything. They owned the only government. Competition was impossible unless they allowed it. Which, human nature begins what it is, was a problematic thing. Can you just say that this was a very dangerous situation because eventually young people will become aware of this and form clandestine organisations to work against it? Ultimately, they will bring down this edifice. You've got to read all the 11 essays, sometimes several times, and only when the ma majesty of the design emerges. emerges. Carnegie proposed that men of wealth re-establish a synthetic free enterprise system, since the real ones were no longer possible, based on cradle-to-grave schooling. The people advanced most successfully in the schooling that was available to everyone who would be given licenses to lead profitable lives, who would be given jobs and promotions that are a large part of the economy the economy had to be tied directly to schooling. 
from an interview with John Taylor Gatto on the origins of compulsory education in Flatland Magazine, number 11, Jim Martin, 994. Compartmentalising and specialisation in the educational system is one method, although a major one that a controller controlling plutocracy uses to regulate large areas of society. This specialisation is seamless as it progresses from university into the professions, everyone doing their bit and no one seeing, except perhaps the few at the top of the pyramid, the complete picture. Considering the economic system as an example, do you believe that in a modern society we could function properly without the banking system that is now in place? And who do you suppose controls that? The following quotes from a, from a few old friends of the system might give a clue. The man who was reported to have said, history is bunkum, Henry Ford indicated he knew the answer to the question when warning of financial control. It is well enough that people of the nation do not understand the banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe, there would be a revolution before morning. And this from Carol Quigley. The power of financial capitalism has another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country. The growth of financial capitalism made possible a centralisation of world economic control and use of power for the direct benefit of financiers. Diligent and persistent investigations will lead to an understanding of how the complexities of the banking system can be used for control. References in the footnotes should be scrutinised with prudence if you're easily shocked, or are content with the way things are, or if you believe you're in control of your destiny for that matter. Take nothing for granted, all assumptions in this fascinating study must be closely examined for proper context. To paraphrase the Buddha, you need only pen, open your mind to hear your own wisdom. We need to get moving if we wish to realise the truth that we are living in an illusion before reality asserts itself, as it eventually does in a way we may not find our liking. The establishment will go to any lengths, and they have, from infanticide to genocide in its defence of its system. This, we are told, is for the greater good. A clever example of how this deception works is the supposed lifting of a foreign debt, which we are told helps third world countries. But in return for this imaginary concession, the host country loses its hand in mineral rights and are pressured into accepting the parasite's belief systems. All these concrete values in exchange for forgiveness of something created out of nothing. Debt. This basic explanation will help you begin to understand how third world countries are left like a carcass after scavengers have sat satiated their hunger, s satiated their hunger. So-called first world countries will inevitably follow. Belief systems that are foisted into third world countries are religions of control, an aspect of the system. They, like us, are deceived into believing they are inherently sinful and are incapable of regeneration. Of course they can be saved if the dogma of the received religion is accepted. Being told they were born in sin, a concept that cannot be rationally explained, like many mystical concepts that have been usurped, usurped and corrupted in order to heap unearned guilt on the, upon the populace, is an exceedingly effective way of transferring values from the rightful owners to the parasites. Where do we get these destructive beliefs from, originally, if not from the same malevolent forces we have seen throughout this chapter? As the great British philosopher Thomas Paine identified, of all the tyrannies that affect mankind, Tyranny in religion is the worst. Every other species of ty tyranny is limited to the world we live in. <coughs> but religion attempts to stride beyond the grave and seeks to pursue us into eternity. Remember how Don Juan explained it. The predators have given us systems of belief, our ideas of good and evil. It is almost impossible for our innocent minds to comprehend how anyone we believe have our best interests at heart could be so malicious. However, the following mysterious document, although unauthenticated and a touch extreme, gels with the concepts presented here and may help expand your understanding of the matrix. The Secret Covenant, an illusion it will be, so large, so vast, will escape their perception. Those who will see it will be thought of as insane. We will create separate fronts to prevent them from seeing the connection between us. We will behave, behave as if we are not connected to help the to keep the illusion alive. Our goal will be accomplished one drop at a time so as to never bring suspicion upon ourselves. This will also prevent them from seeing the changes as they occur. 
We will always stand above the relative field of their experience, for we know the secrets of the Absolute. We will work together, always, and will remain bound by blood and secrecy. Death will come to though he who speaks. We will keep their lifespan short and their minds weak while pretending to do the opposite. We will use our knowledge of science and technology in subtle ways so we'll never see what is happening. We will use soft metals, aging accelerators and sedatives in food and water, also in the air. They will be blanketed by poisons every, everywhere they turn. The soft metals will cause them to lose their minds. We will promise to find a cure from our many fronts, yet we will feed them more poison. The poisons will be absorbed through their skin and mouths. They will destroy their minds and reproductive systems. From all this, their children will be born dead, and we will conceal this information. The poisons will be hidden in everything that surrounds them, and what they drink, eat, breathe and wear. We must be ingenious in dispensing the poisons, for they can see far. We will teach them that the poisons are good, with fun images and musical tones. Those they look up to will help. We will enlist them to push our poisons. They will see our product being used in film and we will grow accustomed to them and we will never know their true effect. When they give birth, we will inject poisons into the blood of their children and convince them it's for their help. We will start early on, when their minds are young. We will target their children with what children love most, sweet things. When their teeth decay, we will fill them with metals that will kill their mind and steal their future. When their ability to learn has been affected, we will cr create medicine that will make them sicker and cause other diseases for which will create yet more medicine. We will render them docile and weak before us by our power. They will grow depressed, slow and obese, and when they come to us for help, we will give them more poison. We will focus their attention towards money and material goods so the many never connect with their inner self. We will distract them with fornication, fornication external pleasures and games so they may never be one with oneness of it all. Their minds will belong to us and they will do as we say. If they refuse, we shall find ways to implement mind-altering technology into their lives. We will use fear as our weapon. We will establish their governments and establish opposites within. We will own both sides. We will always hide our objective but carry out our plan. They will perform the labour for us and we shall prosper from their toil. Our families will never mix with theirs. Our blood must be pure always, for it is the way. We will make them kill each other when it suits us. We will keep them separated from the oneness of, by dogma and religion. We will control all aspects of their lives and tell them what to think and how. We will guide them kindly and gently, letting them think they are guiding themselves. We will ferment animosity between them through our factions. When a light shall shine among them, we shall extinguish it by ridicule or death, whichever suits us best. We will make them rich, rip each other's hearts apart and kill their own children. We will accomplish this by using hate as our ally, anger as our friend. The hate will blind them totally, and never sh shall they see that from their conflicts we emerge as their rulers. They will be busy killing each other. They will bathe in their own blood and kill their neighbours for as long as we see fit. We will benefit greatly from this. For they will not see us, for they ca cannot see us. We will continue to prosper from their wars and their deaths. We shall repeat this over and over until our ultimate goal is accomplished. We will continue to make them live in fear and anger through images and sins. We will use all the tools we have to accomplish this. The tools will be pr provided by their labour. We will make them hate themselves and their neighbours. We will always hide the divine truth from them, that we are all one. This they must never know. They must never know that colour is an illusion. They must always think they are not equal. Drop by drop, drop by drop, we will advance our goal. We will take over their lands, resources and wealth to exercise total control over them. We will deceive them into accepting laws that will steal the little freedom they will have. We will establish a money system that will imprison them forever, keeping them and their children in debt. When they shall band together, we shall accuse them of crimes and present a different story to the world for we shall own all the media. We will use our media to control the flow of information and their sentiment in our favour. When they shall rise up against us, we will crush them like insects, for they are less than that. They will be helpless to do anything, for they will have no weapons. We will recruit some of their own to carry out our plans. We will promise them eternal life, but eternal life they will never have, for they are not of us. The recruits will be called initiates, 
and will be indoctrinated to false rites of passage to higher realms. Members of these groups will think they are one with us, never knowing the truth. They must never learn this truth, that they will turn against us. For their work, they will be rewarded with earthly things and great titles, but never will they become immortal and join us. Never will they receive the light and travel the stars. They will never reach the higher realms, for the killing of their own kind will prevent passage to the realm of enlightenment. This they will never know. The truth will be hidden in their face, so close they are not able to focus on it until it's too late. Oh yes, so grand the illusion of freedom will be that they will never know they are our slaves. When all is in place, the reality we have created for them will own them. This reality will be their prison. They will live in self-delusion. When our goal is accomplished, a new era of domination will begin. Their minds will be bound by their beliefs, the beliefs we have established from time memorial. But if they ever found out they are equal, we shall perish then. This they must never know. If they ever find out that together they can vanquish us, they will take action. They must never ever find out what we have done, for if they do, we shall have no place to run, for it will be easy to see who we are once the veil has fallen. Our actions will have revealed who we are, and they will hunt us down, and no person shall give us shelter. This is a secret covenant by which we live the rest of our present and future lives, for this reality will transcend many generations and lifespans. This covenant is sealed by blood, our blood, we, the ones from heaven to earth came. This covenant must never ever be known to exist. It must never ever be written or spoken of, for it is the consciousness it will spawn will release the fury of the prime creator upon us and we shall be cast into the depths from whence we came and remain there until the end of time, infinity itself. Conveniently, author unknown. There is no simple answer as to why of this seemingly malevolence. It could be as straightforward as philosopher Ayn Rand says, they hate the good because it is good. It is no accident so many silver-tongued, Clinton-like politicians who preach freedom while at the same time destroying it have come to the fore recently. The purpose for this is twofold. Firstly, it shows the politicians as the charlatans they really are, and secondly, to destroy the matrix of illusions as quickly and mercifully as possible. These concepts may sound implausible. They were difficult for me to accept in the beginning, but all that is needed to prove their validity is for each of us to question the reality that we find ourselves in. This will have the effect of opening thinking processes we may never have used before. We will then discover for ourselves that the injustices we see all around us could not, could only be tolerated in an irrational society. In fact, a veritable anti-civilization. In a rational society, we will be living to our true nature, which results in a peaceful, well-filled and romantic life instead of living in a debt-ridden society where our natural state has been suffocated and completely corrupted. Unfortunately, our minds have been trained to accept the status quo as beneficial to society. The only way to begin to understand the control that operates among us is to first learn to take heed of the still small voice, the part of us the system cannot deceive. We find that what is really controlled is the information that enters our brain through our five senses, like software for a computer. It is e easy to understand that whoever controls the information controls the individual whose mind accepts the programming. This is more subtle than trying to suppress a country by brute force as history shows when looking at communism by way of example. The Machiavellian option has always been to control the masses through their beliefs along with some public relations exercises. Nothing else is needed. Remember what Mayor Rothschild said, I want to own nothing but control everything. This, as you may already have discovered, causes a conflict in our feelings because we really believe we are free. The reason for this belief, we are told repeatedly, until we get it, is that we live in a democracy and we've been programmed to believe democracy equals freedom. Yet, what is democracy but the tyranny of the mob over the individual, the smallest minority of all? But if the individual's rights are protected, then all rights are protected. Oscar Wilde eloquently explains the problem with democracy. High hopes were once formed of democracy, but democracy means simply bludgeoning of the people, by the people, for the people. This reinforces the conflict we grapple with. We assume we are free, yet there is a subtle, uncomfortable feeling that there is something wrong, like a splinter in your mind. It would be re remiss of me to leave this chapter without briefly mentioning the ultimate conspiracy. 
Have you ever heard of the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion? This infamous document came to light in Russia during 1905 and was tra translated by one Victor Marsden in London in 1910. Marsden stated that he could not work on the protocols more than 30 minutes at a time because the contents were so evil. It was supposedly the minutes of a meeting held by a cabal of Jewish bankers whose intent was to take over the world by manipulating the goyim, a Jewish slur word for Gentiles. Ever since these writings were brought to public attention, there have been fierce debates as to whether they were genuine or not. Bern, Switzerland, was the scene of a court case to decide their authenticity in the years 1934-35. to The court conclu concluded that the protocols were a forgery, a strange judgment if it was trying to say they never existed. If they were a forgery, they must have been an original. This is a complex and confusing study and worth of a volume on its own. The only comment that is added here is to point out that some of the ideas found in the protocols were originally penned by Maurice Jolly, a Rosa Curie and an eminent French lawyer, in his pamphlet Dialogues and held between Machiavelli and Montesquieu, 1864. This was seen at the time as an attack on the political ambitions of Napoleon, but it was also demonstrates the shadowy hand of the secret societies in the controversy. This is born out of the claims that the protocols were the work of an 18th century Illuminati who were by no means exclusively Jewish, although some of its members were. We will use several samples taken from the Illuminati protocols to further underline the assertions in this chapter that there is something very powerful, not connected to religion or nationality, working behind the curtains in the throne room, for good or evil. Who knows? We are too strong. There is no evading our power. The nations cannot come to even an inconsiderable private agreement without our secretly having a hand in it. Do not suppose for a moment that these statements are empty words. Think carefully of the successes we arrange from Darwinism, Marxism, Nietzscheism. Our power in the present tottering condition, all forms of power, will be more invincible than any other. Statement like these, that most people do not understand easily, turn the misnamed protocols of the learned elders of Zion into a fuel for the evil anti-Semitic Semitism that has raged unchecked in Europe for hundreds of years. Nesta Webster mentions that mentions them in her book Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, which should read for a fuller understanding of how they were interpreted at different times. Webster also points out the confusion the protocols present even to a seasoned investigators. An international circle of world revolutionaries working on the lines of the Illuminati, of which the existence had already been indicated, offers a perfectly possible alternative to the learned elders of Zion. Conclusion the goal of this chapter was to discover, if it was possible, for the history of a minor battle to have been manipulated. We found the evidence for this to be overwhelming yet confusing because what most people think of as a conspiracy is a system looking after itself. It's possible we do not or cannot envisage a system in control of itself with the houses being its facilitators. Nevertheless, we found it would take another book to record all the information that points to a clandestine power directing elected governments as these mysterious documents such as the pro protocols demonstrate. Ultimately, you will have to make up your mind about the conspiracy. If you believe there is one, why do you believe this? If you think it's all nonsense, why do you believe that? These concepts seem, on the face of it, very pessimistic, but only through understanding the parasitical system do we have any hope of overcoming it. And to overcome it, we must, to free our minds. In the final analysis, it is the elite houses who have constructed the parasitical system, a global prison, a prison without bars. No one can explain the deception logically. How can anyone explain a delusion that is so powerful and omnipresent that it is impossible for most people to fathom? One of the jailers mocks, it's only the small secrets that needs protecting. The big ones protect themselves by public incredulity. There is an ever-present danger we must be aware of when treading through this minefield of control, and that is the cry of conspiracy theory and anti-Semitism, especially when attempting to understand the complex world of the international banking system. This complexity is seized by extremists of all shades to prove a false premise, that is, the Jews are trying to rule the world. Complicating things further, there has been a long-term strategy by the Illuminati to mask their intention of undermining and finally destroying the power of the parasitical elite. They believed by inviting hysteria against themselves, the criticisms would sooner or later lose credibility. 
For example, the Illuminati realised their secret protocols would eventually be publicly revealed. Thus, they drafted their protocols to appear as a Jewish or Zionist plot to place all human beings under one world tyrannical rule. They even mistitled their document the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Throughout that document, they also shrewdly planted a Jewish slur word for Gentiles to describe their targets, the Goyim. Let it be said loud and clear, the prot Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion had nothing whatsoever to do with the Jewish race, and if you believe it has, you are asking the wrong questions. Anti-Semitism is a result of envy. Jews are resented because of their business acumen that leads them to flourish anywhere in the world. This is possible, possibly because their religion is less damaging to the human mind than other debilitating religions. You have to look at the business expertise of the Rothschilds to confirm this. It was the Rothschilds' monetary assistance that was instrumental in ending the so-called Irish potato famine. However, Zionism is a different story altogether. Jewish history, like every other racist history, has been manipulated by a parasitical system. If you have resonated with some of the ideas in this chapter, you will be better able to understand the theories about the importance of the Battle of the Boyne as the key to unravelling Western history. As an unknown philosopher acknowledged, our minds are like parachutes, they only work when they are open. You only have to keep your mind open a little longer for an amazing picture to unfold. In the meantime, explore the references in this book and your attitude to life will change forever, guaranteed. To prove this for yourself, a pursuit a perusal of the article at www.localgroup.net articlesworld.html which epitomises the contents of this chapter will challenge your comfortable view of reality. We now proceed to examine the connections between the ancient land of Bruna Boyne and the ritual battle. As we do this, we will unearth the amazing discoveries about the people who lived there and examine just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Every civilization carries the seeds of its own destruction and the same cycle shows in them all. The Republic is born, flourishes, decays into plutocracy, and is captured by the shoemaker, whom the mercenaries and millionaires make into a king. The people invent their own oppressors, and the oppressors serve the function for which they are invented. Mark Twain, Eruption. So guys, that's the end of that chapter, and here's just some footnotes. I'll just slowly scale through them. You've got Jordan Maxwell, David Talbot, um, just all the books that were referenced. So I'll slowly go through. You can pause it, have a look at it. But that was a really interesting chapter. Uh, really gives me the drive to carry on reading the book. It's definitely a page turner, no doubt. So, guys, I'll see you in chapter three. Bru Naboin. Hope you have a great weekend and I'll see you all later. Cheers.